Have you ever seen the movie Wizard of Oz? Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. It's all about power, money, and control. The Five Eyes Alliance was created in the aftermath of World War II to monitor enemy communications and share intelligence between its founding nations. It is now recognized as the largest spying network in history. There are standard things which intelligence agencies do. So war warning, are our enemies going to attack us tomorrow? And that's an unchanging target. What you're doing is you're establishing a background of indicators, perhaps 200 indicators. And what you want to know is, has anything changed today? If suddenly there's more railway traffic, if suddenly Russian hospitals are buying more blood plasma, a whole load of things which might say your enemy is going to war. So those things you will just do routinely. Then there's questions relating to policy. America's changing its policy towards China. It's thinking about invading Iran. So a very broad spectrum of threats. The end of the Cold War in the early 1990s saw the demise of the Soviet Union as a superpower and a threat. Up till then, the Five Eyes had been primarily focused on collecting intelligence from the communist bloc. So politicians began to question their agency's worth. So they were sitting there, how can we justify our existence? So you look around and say, well, there's this explosion in digital communications and there's bad guys in there doing things. So this is our new target. In order to keep up with it, we have to have an ever-increasing budget. We need more and more people. That's how you build an empire. While funding to the Five Eyes Alliance has dramatically increased since the beginning of the 21st century, the agencies continue to remain largely autonomous from the governments who fund them. Governments come and go, they're told the minimum. In a way, they're kind of scared of the spies. And so these agencies are mostly ships that run themselves. Most people outside of the intelligence apparatus themselves in foreign governments don't even know the existence of that relationship. Politicians don't want to talk about it, they just want the, the one-up in whatever uh, negotiation they're entering into. So they're left alone, they're left to kind of do their own business. I think it's an inevitable tension in all countries with major intelligence agencies. Most of what goes on doesn't seem to be known. And that builds up a culture where the agencies start to believe that that's their right. They see political accountability as a risk and so while you can't say that they completely run themselves as a rogue or something, in practice a lot of what they do is completely separate from the governments that they're under. The 9-11 terrorist attacks on the United States gave the Five Eyes a legitimate reason to expand. It was going in this direction anyway, but 9-11 incredibly accelerated it. Once you got the terrorist attack here, we became very unforgiving in not grabbing communications. And so we accelerated our ability, our, for want of a better word, invasiveness in, into communications networks in which legitimate targets coexisted with legitimately protected communications. There was a distinct change after September 11. Something, something changed which at least in the smaller agencies, had been a, a no-go zone, which was that was using these Cold War, massive national security resources against the citizens of, of the Five Eyes countries. That had been something that just never usually happened in a country like New Zealand or Australia or Canada. Um, and September 11 loosened that. The United States and Britain completely dropped all their sense of restraint about it. And these agencies are closer to each other than they are to their own governments. 
As a result of changes since September 11, 2001, the Five Eyes Alliance is now capable of capturing virtually every phone conversation, email, internet search or social media entry in the world. What kind of information? Your location for where you currently are. Text messages, emails, uh, your buddy lists, your calendar as it gets sent around the world. Um, if you're having a video chat with somebody, uh, that gets recorded. This level of mass surveillance raises important questions about the trade-off between security and democracy. The absolute raw fact of the matter is that if you wanted GCHQ or NSA or ASD or these other services to do for you what it was they did in the 70s and 80s, intercept communications of those who would will you harm, if you wanted them to do that in the 21st century, you have to be in the flow of data that actually contained your information and mine. There's no other way. Once you adopt these totalitarian procedures, I mean, this is straight out of the KGB, Stasi, Gestapo, SS, you know, Mao's people, everybody. All the dictator and despots down through history do this kind of thing. And so once you adopt that, then you have to, then you have to do in secret, pass laws or change things and, and suppress your population and, and keep them from knowing what you're doing. And so you have an uninformed public and so you've destroyed your democracy. That's what's happening. 